my title is Issues in Measuring Wine Shapes. This title was su suggested by Randall. And um, it's OK. We will get to that. But first, I need to show you why we need to do that. So what I'm going to do is try to show how I um, go through the spectrum uh, and check whether what I get as a fit actually makes any sense. And so I'm going to, uh, here's my outline. So I'm going to, the motivation is for, is to develop uh, diagnostics for stellar coronal heating. But what I'm going to talk about most is what to do when the best fit doesn't, it doesn't fit. So how much of that is related to the atomic data? Um, how do we examine all the spectral components and see if the fit makes sense from various aspects, um, which I will describe. And then things, maybe there are things to try, like the line shape. So yesterday we um, heard from uh, Lee Yi Gu, and he talked a lot about how the stronger lines seem to do really well and the weaker lines don't. So I'm going to partly give you a tour of what it looks like down in the weeds. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so why do we want, what am I gonna try to do? Well, I'm interested in trying to solve the solar coronal heating problem by using stars. The people who work on the sun are much, uh, very much interested in getting very high spatial resolution down to the spatial scales of magnetic strands. We're never gonna do that with stars. Um, but this unsolved problem um, is something that we can look at with stars if we look at with spectroscopy. And so, First of all, we've, we've learned from uh, Stella Caroni observed starting with EUVE, the Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer, and more recently Chandra and the XMM gratings, that many of the more active stars have high, very high density compared with solar active regions, a factor of 100 or maybe more than that in density. And that means that the magnetic fields are pretty high, like maybe 500 Gauss. And it, um, it sort of begs the question whether these really should look like solar corona. Um, and so uh, there are two models I'll describe, but the solar impulsive flare models can reproduce the emission measure distribution shape, but so far they have not been able to produce um, th such a shape at high electron density. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are two classes of models. One is called impulsive heating or nanoflare models. And they are intrinsically non-equilibrium ionization models. What happens is lots of little um, loops get heated up all over the place, and the um, the plasma uh, they're impulsive heating, so the plasma ionizes really quickly, and then the recombination time scale is much longer. And so, on average, you're going to see if you're looking at time average or spatial and time average, like we are that the plasma should appear to be recombining. That sentence is in the next bullet uh, where it didn't belong. Uh, so the other kind of models are magnetic wave heating models like alphane waves. And those are steady state models more or less. And basically the idea is that these waves are coming up through the chromosphere and they're just heating the loops uniformly from below. So there's no reason to expect them to be out of ionization equilibrium. So the way you can tell the difference is to take a temperature that you determine from a single ionization state and compare it to the temperature that you get from the charge state distribution in collisional ionization equilibrium. Next slide. Okay, so here's the trick. We wanna look at the dielectronic recombination satellite line um, it, because it has a very powerful, it can be a very powerful tool. Um, so this shows, first of all, how much more sensitive the DR satellite line ratio to Lyman alpha. In this case, I'm going to talk exclusively about oxygen 8, but it's generally applicable, compared to the helium-like G ratios, which have very shallow dependence on the electron temperature. Now, I thought this was great, but then I realized that because the DR satellite lines are so weak, they're down by a factor of 500 or 1,000 from the peak of Lyman alpha, that it actually doesn't make very much statistical difference which ones you would use. However, next slide. Um, there are lots and lots of satellite lines in the, um, in the atom DB, and this is just a group of lines that extends only 50 milliangstroms to the long wavelength side of the first Lyman alpha line. Um, 
And you can see there's one that's pretty strong. It's actually in the wings of the line, and we'll, I'll show you um, later where that is. But there are lots of satellite lines, and these DR lines are great because they're, they're recombining from oxygen 8 to oxygen 7, and therefore they have the same population as the Lyman alpha line. Next slide. So just to remind you, the helium-like diagnostics work for temperature because of the dependence of the, so the temperature ratio is the ratio of the X plus Y plus Z lines over the W line shown here. And because the strong resonance line W um, has a different dependence uh, of the collisional excitation rate as a function of energy and therefore temperature, you get a temperature dependent line ratio. We know these two from the the electron density diagnosis, which is how we just determined um, with, with Chandra and XMM that the densities are actually high. And that, that works just because the triplet S level is metastable, it builds up population at low densities. But if the density is high enough, it's going to collisionally excite up to the triplet P levels and then basically transfer its population upward and change the line ratio of the X plus Y over Z. Next slide. Okay, so this shows you why the helium-like lines aren't really going to help solve the problem that I want to solve. So if you, and this was a similar pie chart that I think Lee showed yesterday for iron 25. So basically the resonance line is pretty much populated by direct excitation. However, the forbidden line is not. And if, in fact, in the recombining plasma, it's going to be Hot. Even in an equilibrium plasma, it's not even majority populated by direct excitation. And in a recombining plasma, it's definitely going to be populated a lot by recombination. So it's not going to give us the pure uh, signature that we're really looking for. Um, next slide. So that's why we want to use the DR satellite lines. Okay, this is a plot of the emission measure distribution for Capella. And Every spectrum I'm going to show you is the same spectrum, the same sum of uh, MEG data uh, for since we started looking at Capella up till a few years ago when I uh, stopped adding them into this uh, for now. But we're, we're going to keep working on this. And anyway, you'll see that it's a, um, it's a continuous distribution. This is what the way most people who work on stellar coroni think of this. Um, the, so it's not something that you're going to get out of a, if you try to fit this with X spec, you might get three temperatures, but you're not going to get all these temperatures. But if you go and you look at individual lines, um, you look at all the hydrogen to helium like ratios, you look at the iron L shell lines, you actually can fill in a distribution that gives you a better fit. Um, the most important thing is there's a really strong peak at about 6 million degrees. This is on a log scale. So that peak is really dominant. And everything I'm going to say is mostly related to that peak. So the rest of this mostly doesn't matter. But I just wanted to show you this is what the distribution looks like. Next. OK, so the first thing I do with a fit like that is I check the line-free regions. We heard about models where you can separate out the continuum from the lines. But I also want to look at where are the lines in the spectrum. So I look in the database to look for line-free regions. But sometimes those regions aren't line free because we don't have all the lines in the model and we also don't have all the lines in the right place. So testing this where it looks like both the database and the spectrum agree that there are no lines there is kind of a trick, but that's one of the first things that I try to do to make sure that the overall model is gonna fit the continuum because it's really important to get the continuum right because that's what we're gonna measure the DR satellite lines against. Next. Next slide, please. Okay, the second thing I check is the strong line. So um, this is just an example. I would do this for many lines that are formed from that emission measure peak. But in this particular part of the spectrum, we're looking at oxygen 8, lime, and alpha, which is the strongest line at around 19 angstroms. And then we're looking at the O7. You can see the triplets, and you can see one more line from O7, the helium beta line. And they look pretty good. You can see that the, two, the intercombination and forbidden line of O7 don't quite fit, particularly the intercombination line. Um, it's pretty close. I'm not going to worry about that, but just to point out that it's still not a perfect fit. And you can see the continuum lies really low. 
compared to what I see a lot of people fitting uh, coronal spectra where the continuum would come up much higher. But this has been fit to lines out to, to line free regions outside of this region, both on the long wavelength side and on the short wavelength side. So I think this is a good fit. Next slide, please. Another thing I do is I want to make sure that the emission from the line I'm interested in is actually coming from the temperature that I think it is. So if you look at the red um, plot, that's the emissivity of oxygen eight, uh, scaled of course, and you can see it peaks a little bit lower than the peak of the emission measure distribution. But when you fold those through, um, you can determine where, from which part of the emission measure the oxygen eight is coming from, and it is indeed coming most, mostly from that very strong dominant peak. So that tells us that we know the collision, essentially this is gonna tell us that we know the temperature oxygen A is formed out in the collision ionization equilibrium models. Next slide, please. Okay, so another thing I do is look for weak lines. So I wanna identify all the lines I can, because that's gonna give me a sanity check on where I'm putting the continuum and where I'm basically, do I have blending? Should I worry about blending? How well are we doing? Um, and this is where I say we're, we're basically in the weeds. So the nitrogen seven lines you can see there were in the database. That chromium 16 line was in the database, but it was completely in the wrong place. So I wasn't at all sure that that was correct, but I had to do some digging around so if there's chromium-16, uh, that's the fluorine light, so there's probably chlorine chromium-15, which is the neon light, and that has lots of lines, so let's see if we can find those. Because if we can find those, then this identification is probably correct. Next slide. And so you can see that the chromium-15 was in the database, and there, there are six lines that you can identify in the spectrum, just like with iron-17. Um, only they were in the wrong place. So I fixed the wavelengths. I also had to fix the wavelength for the chromium 16 line to make sure that it's in the right place. Uh, fixing the wavelengths is a, is a trick all into itself, which we can talk about if somebody's interested. It's not always trivial though. There are lines and line lists from NIST, but getting them to match up to what we have in the database is not always trivial. Next slide, please. Okay, so then we come down to the line itself. So if I don't get the, if I can't get the line width right, the, uh, the line shape right, then I'm gonna have a lot of trouble fitting lines, fitting any DR satellite lines that are close to this. And you can't, it doesn't look too bad if you're, if you're looking at the top of the plot, but if you look down at the bottom, that red line is a little bit too high and I cannot get it down using what is a six term Gaussian fit to the calibration model in the RMF file. So Lorentzian, you would wanna, uh, doesn't work either. I used a Moffitt uh, function, which is, has a parameter extra than a Voigt function, but at this point it's still just a Voigt function. If we go to the next slide, now you can see where the problems are really coming. The red line doesn't fit at all and you can't pull it down because it's fitting so nicely at the top where all the counts are. Um, and the Moffitt function looks pretty good on the long wavelength side. On the short wavelength side, maybe not so much. The next slide you can see, next slide. So again, on the long wavelength side, those residuals are actually lines on the, Short wavelength side, they're not. So this is something where the Moffitt function has a, has a term where you can adjust the symmetry and I might, uh, that's sort of the next thing to try. Um, next slide. Okay, so the fit still isn't perfect and I still have a couple of lines that I don't know what they are and it worries me. You have to worry about blendings. So this is the best fit so far. So I mentioned that strong DR satellite line. Um, you can see it in the uh, around 19.07 angstroms. It's in the wing of the line, as you can tell. Um, 
we actually have, and this is hard to see on this plot, I apologize, but basically there are three groups of satellite lines that you can make measurements of. One of them fits really well, one of them is too strong, and the other is too weak compared with the models. So there's some issue with the temperature dependence possibly in the models or just the models themselves in general. But in any case, assuming that we don't have line blending, which is a concern, we can measure the fluxes of those lines and get a tentative answer So the next slide. So now we see the observed line ratio on the plot for the satellite line ratio to the parent, the Lyman alpha line. And it's very close to the oxygen eight temperature that we derived from the emission measure distribution, which depends almost entirely on the temperature dependence of the charge state distribution and collisional ionization equilibrium. So it looks like um, this is more of an equilibrium plasma and not so much of a um, out of equilibrium, which implies that this plasma may be heated, heated by magnetic waves rather than the more popular model that people um, like for the solar heating. Next slide. Okay. In summary, the signal to noise ratio in the spectrum is actually good enough. You can see that I have a pretty nice error bar on that. The continuum fit works really well throughout the spectrum as long as you're careful to think about where the line free regions are according to the database and where they are according to just your observations. The 07 and 08 strong lines fit very well but the calibration line spread function probably isn't good enough and we, can, we have some more ways to probably improve that. And it's definitely true that the unidentified lines, lines at the wrong wavelength still con are confusing the picture, um, something that we're gonna have to work at from the laboratory astrophysics side of things. So the tentative result is that maybe we have magnetic wave heating not the favorite model for the sun, but maybe this is um, correct anyway. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You still have uh, plenty of time left. Um, does anybody have any questions? I don't see any yet, but that was just a, a great example of issues with fitting lines. So I can raise a question that Randall asked me a while ago. And the question was whether the line spread function problem is a calibration problem or whether it's actually an astrophysics problem. And um, I think that my guess is that it's a calibration problem. We are really down in the wings of a very, very strong line. But the way to test that would be to take that same line, once we get a line response function that we like, that fits, we look at lines in the spectrum that come from that same emission measure distribution peak and see if they also have the same line shape. And then look at lines that maybe are hotter, which um, not only don't come from that part of the emission measure distribution, they don't even come from the same star because Capella is a binary. And if they don't have the same shape, then we might have a problem. And they're distributed throughout the spectrum. You can go hydrogen-like, helium-like, and get some idea of whether that is actually more likely a calibration problem or a physics problem. I, I don't think it's a physics problem, but it could be. Well, Martin Lamming has a comment. It's entirely possible that a nano flare and the solar cell corona release is a significant fraction of its energy as waves that damp non-locally. There's a whole range of possibilities here. Yes, I agree. I mean, I, I'm not a modeler. I just, um, I, I just the, the nano flare models, uh, I mean, the, there's another issue which has to do with whether the density is really constant. Um, you could heat something that's dense and then the density could, decrease as material uh, expands or something. So there are many other issues, but this is at least the first way to see if we have something that might be interesting and different from the sun. All right. We have one question from Greg. Uh, he says, just a comment that Beersdorfer, Hell, and Lepsen published similar analysis using DR line from 3C and iron uh, 17. They included DR satellites up to N equals 30. 
do you know how high an N the oxygen model includes? So if you're talking about the how high an N in the DR lines, no, I'm, I don't know that, but they're all, all the cascades, I think we go up to N equals 10, so there should be cascades um, from above that that are going into those levels. All right. Um, maybe time for one or two more questions. Are there lines that do not have satellites for comparison? Uh, maybe the Iron, Iron 17, uh, 17A lines. That's from John so Raymond. I did look at the Iron 17 lines at 17 angstroms. Um, there, there are some satellite lines, but there, those actually look pretty similar to the line shape that I'm getting from Oxygen 8. So yeah, that's a great thing to also look at. And just uh, 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 from Chris Dunn, what do the DR lines tell us? So the DR lines are an important way to test the ionization balance. And when you look at a fit to a, um, a typical spectrum like this, the temperature dependence is, uh, is entirely coming from the charge state distribution. It's not really coming from the something like you, the temperature dependence that you would get from the helium-like systems. So you have to look at line ratios. And what you want to do to test ionization equilibrium is use temperature sensitive diagnostics from the same ionization state. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here. 